Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to kick off this session on excipient and formulation considerations. I'm Darby Kozak, the Deputy Director of the Division of Therapeutic Performance. And my talk will focus on the general regulatory considerations and recommendations when developing your generic formulation and some best practices for soliciting FDA's feedback on your formulation. By the end of my talk, you will be able to describe what Q1, Q2 sameness is know the Code of Federal Regulation Requirements for Generic Formulations, how a bioequivalence approach can depend on the formulation sameness, and what are best practices when proposing and getting FDA's feedback on your generic formulation. Ultimately, it's important to note that even the most complex products need to get the basics right to reach approval. So what is Q1, Q2? Q1, Q2 is a general acronym that refers to the qualitative and quantitative amount of inactive ingredients in a formulation. And these amounts and ingredients are generally compared to the references to drug formulations. Code of Federal Regulations, Section 31494A9, outlines the regulatory considerations for inactive ingredients in a generic product. In general, an applicant must identify and characterize the inactive ingredients in the proposed drug product and provide information demonstrating that such inactive ingredients do not affect the safety or efficacy of the proposed drug product. It also specifies that for some drug products, such as parental, ophthalmic, and otic drugs, that changes are only permissible for some inactive ingredients that have a specific function in the formula. These permissible ingredient differences are often called exception excipients. And if the ingredient is not an exception excipient, it must be Q1, Q2 the same as the reference listed drug to be eligible for ANDA submission. So Q1 is generally considered the identity of the inactive ingredient, and an applicant should provide detailed information on the chemistry of the inactive ingredient used in the formulation and may also want to include information and comparative characterization to support complex ingredient sameness. Q2 is the amount of ingredient in the formulation and is generally considered to be acceptable if the amount is within 5% of the RLD amount. To facilitate Q2 determination, it is recommended that you report values on a weight percentage and or in a milligram per mil amount and that you report the values out to the same number of decimal places which should be the same as the ingredient with the smallest significant reported amount. In general, you should list ingredients out to at least two decimal places. This will facilitate FDA's assessment and reduce the FDA's need to send information requests. It is also important to note that FDA does not consider differences in the hydrate form of an ingredient to be a Q1 difference and will determine Q2 sameness based on the anhydrous basis of both the proposed formulation and the reference listed drug. For non-compendial inactive ingredients, such as polylactate, coglycolate, PLGA, FDA will often request that you submit a comparative characterization data of the ingredient extracted from the reference listed drug product and the ingredient extracted from your proposed generic product. This is done to ensure that the structural identity of the ingredient is the same in the finished product. For these polymeric materials, such as PLGA, comparative characterization can include polymer composition, such as the L to G ratio, the polymer molecular weight, the molecular weight distribution, its polymeric structure, such as being linear or star, the in-group chemistry, carboxylic acid, or ester, the inherent viscosity of the polymer solution, as well as the glass transition temperature. To improve our understanding and to facilitate generic product development, FDA has funded and published a number of research articles on analytical methods to characterize these complex excipients. This information supports qualitative sameness to the RLD, and justification should be included if and as to why any differences would not impart the safety or efficacy of the generic drug as compared to the RLD. 
In some instances, a Q2 difference may be justified or deemed acceptable, provided additional information is included to support that the amount is within the range found in the references to drug. For example, you may provide reverse engineering of the RLD to demonstrate that the variability in the RLD is more than plus or minus 5%, and that your proposed product is within this range. Also, a common Q2 issue is the amount of each ingredient used to create a buffer. Although not always acceptable, you may consider providing information that the total buffer concentration, including buffer capacity of your generic product, is within 5% of the references to drug and that the pH is similar to the references to drug. Often it is best to submit such information and justification for FDA feedback either through a control correspondence or by pre-ANDA meeting request prior to submitting it in an ANDA. As per the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 320.22, the bioequivalence of some drug products may be considered self-evident based on the generic product formulation. In particular, parental, ophthalmic, and otic solutions are eligible for this waiver of the in vivo bioequivalence studies if the formulation is Q1, Q2 to the RLD. Solution products indicated for other routes of administration may also be eligible for a waiver of in vivo bioequivalence studies and need not be Q1, Q2, provided any ingredient differences do not affect the bioavailability. For oral tablets and capsules, the biopharmaceutics classification system provides guidance on when these products may be eligible for a waiver of in vivo bioequivalence testing. This guidance recommends that, in addition to dissolution and probability information, the proposed generic have the same inactive ingredients and that the amounts be very similar as a reference product. As the guidance specifies acceptable ranges for each ingredient type, the Q2 convention of plus minus 5% generally does not apply. The BCS guidance provides recommendations on permissible difference in the grade of an ingredient, as well as acceptable ranges for common components, such as lubricants and glidants. It is important to note that a breakdown of the film coating composition is generally not included in the formulation assessment. As FDA continues to develop bioequivalence pathways that are dependent on the generic formulation similarity to the reference product, we continue to develop and clarify our use and definition of Q1, Q2. In the past, this term has been used as a general terminology to describe highly similar formulations, but we aspire to do better and provide more clarity about how the regulatory system works. This includes utilizing more appropriate terminology when referring to formulation sameness that may not fall into regulatory and scientific space of Q1, Q2 sameness. An example of this is for drug products that are not required by the Code of Federal Regulations to be Q1, Q2 the same as a reference listed drug. For topical dermatological products, you may notice that more of these product-specific guidances now use the terminology no difference in inactive ingredients when referring to generic formulations that may be eligible for a characterization-based bioequivalence approach. This now leverages information from approved drug products and the generic applicant's data to give greater flexibility in the formulation assessment compared to products required by CFR to be Q1, Q2 to the RLD. Dr. Sam Ramey will discuss this in more detail tomorrow in the session on topical dermatological products. Depending on the formulation regulations and published product-specific guidance recommendations, you can request the FDA's feedback on a proposed generic formulation. For parental, ophthalmic, and otic dosage forms, where Q1, Q2 sameness is required by the regulation, you may submit up to three proposed formulations in a control correspondence. It is important to note that if a parental product is co-packaged with a diluent, then the formulation assessment is made on the whole product and not the individual components. For routes of administration where regulations do not require Q1, Q2 sameness, such as dermatological, oral, and inhalation products, FDA will generally not respond to a control correspondence requesting formulation assessment unless a product-specific guidance includes a formulation similarity recommendation to be eligible for a bioequivalence approach. In those instances, 
you may submit a control correspondence asking if your proposed formulation is eligible for that particular bioequivalence approach recommended in the guidance. Similarly, if a generic formulation is required to be Q1, Q2 for 21 Code of Federal Regulations 314.94 and eligible for the biowaiver for 21 Code of Federal Regulations 320.22, you may submit a control correspondence to ask if your proposed generic formulation is acceptable to file as an ANDA and if it is eligible for a waiver of in vivo testing. If a formulation is not required to be Q1, Q2 per regulation and there is no product-specific guidance available that provides a formulation-dependent approach, you may propose a bioequivalence approach and ask FDA if it is acceptable to use such an approach with your proposed generic formulation. Currently, this communication may be best made through a pre-ANDA meeting request rather than a controlled correspondence, as you may include additional information and justification to support your proposed formulation and your bioequivalence approach. Regardless of the communication pathway taken, it is always important that you include the quantitative amount of each inactive ingredient in your proposed formulation. Specify the target value for any ingredient that is used on a quantity sufficient basis. Specify the nominal amount used, not including any overages. Use matching names of compendial standards if such grade materials are used. Ensure that the amount of any inactive ingredient does not exceed the relevant limit in the FDA's inactive ingredient database and perform comparative characterization on any complex non-compendial and active ingredient if recommended to do so in a product-specific guidance. It is also important to note that pH adjusters are not exception excipients as per 21 Code of Federal Regulations 314.94, and there may be instances where a pH adjuster is not in the reference listed drug labeling, but is used in the RLD product. As such, the current expectation is that the proposed generic contains the same pH adjusters as those in the references to drug. It is also recommended that you include additional information such as rationale and justification for a pH adjuster that has an additional function of formulation that requires a specific amount, such as an in situ converter. In these instances, a specified minimum amount of pH adjuster used potential range of the pH adjuster used, and any supporting information justification may be requested to help FDA make a sameness assessment. Lastly, if you believe there's an error in the RLD labeling or in the FDA's response to your formulation assessment, please provide additional information such as comparative characterization of the reference product and your formulation composition and any supporting justification that supports your position. This can be submitted as a new control correspondence or as a pre-ANDA meeting request, depending on the complexity of the product and the complexity of the scientific justification. In summary, Q1, Q2 sameness refers to the same inactive ingredients and amounts within plus or minus 5% to the references to drug. FDA often uses the Q1, Q2 sameness language in general terms, but it aspires to do better and provide more clarity about how the regulatory system works. In addition, FDA aims to provide guidance for products that may not require Q1, Q2 sameness, of which a bioequivalence approach may depend on the formulation sameness to the reference product. You should provide rationale and supportive data for formulation assessments that may include non-compendial excipients or variations outside the conventional Q1, Q2 paradigm. Ultimately, it is important to take the bioequivalence approach into consideration when framing formulation assessment questions to the agency. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in the Office of Generic Drugs and Office of Pharmaceutical Quality for the thinking on and implementation of formulation assessments, as well as acknowledge and thank you for your attention. I'll be back at the end of the session during the panel to field any questions that you may have. Now for our challenge questions, challenge question one, for quantitative sameness, ingredients amounts should be reported to blank and are assessed as acceptable if the TR ratio percent 
is less than or equal to blank. A, the whole number to 5%. B, whole number to 5.0%. C, two decimal places, 5%. Or D, two decimal places to 5.0%. The answer is C, at least the two decimal places into the whole number 5%. For challenge question two, generic drug products that are solutions must be Q1, Q2 to the RLD to be eligible for submission as an ANDA. True or false? False. 